Our next speaker is Jeremy Hoffing, and the talk is entitled Navigating Rails with Peace of Mind. Hello, hi, my name is Jeremy Hoffing. Uh, I'm a software developer from Los Angeles, and uh, I work mostly, mostly in the startup world. Um, I've been doing development in Ruby on Rails for about four years now. And, uh, now, you know, my talk's about navigating Rails with peace of mind um, because um, there's two things that give me lots of headaches uh, in my experiences across you know, different projects. And um, those things are complex forms and uh, microservices architecture. So um, I'm sure you've had headaches with those as well. So I want to talk about why they give me headaches and uh, you know what are some things we can do about it. So complex <laughs> forms and accepts and attributes for. So um, you can use complex forms uh, and accepts and attributes for if you want to create um, you know two resources at the same time. So um, here is a complex form, and it's actually not even that complex. Uh, I have an author, and I want to be able to create uh, you know, books that belong to the author at the same time. And uh, so here's the code to do that. Uh, I have you know, my parent model author that has many books. I have the um, uh, book class that belongs to the author. And if I want to be able to create both at the same time, I can add accepts nested attributes for, for books, and that will work. Um, I also have to add some more code uh, you know, in the controller. In my new action, I have to add author.books.build to be able to create um, fields in the form for those. And um, in my view, I have to say uh, you know, fields for books and then put in the book attributes. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Um, you also have to deal with strong params, and it's pretty confusing. Um, if I want to be able to create uh, books along with author, I have to first say books underscore attributes, and then pass an array of, um, of the book attributes. And it's confusing how it's reversed, because I have to permit an array to pass a hash, and I have to permit a hash to pass an array. And so let's go ahead and finally submit this form. And, uh, you know, that works. You know, um, I can go edit the author, I can see, uh, you know, it saved the book. Um, so let me go ahead and add uh, validations to this. So I'll just start by adding validations to the author. Um, just, you know, validating the presence of first name and last name. I'll go ahead and submit this. And uh, this works, it's great. I see the uh, errors for first and last name. Now, let's go ahead and add validations to the nested resource. And this is kind of where everything starts falling apart. <laughs> so, I'm going to add a validate, a validate depends up to the title for a book. And I'll resubmit the form and I'll leave the title blank. And this is what happens. You know, it creates an invalid book um, model object. And, uh, Okay, so, you know, you get this error, and uh, it's trying to render the, the uh, attributes for an invalid um, book model. And so, to fix this, uh, I can add an option to accept nested attributes for, where I, um, you know, I can say reject if, and then, um, uh, you know, if the attribute for title is blank, then it won't be able to submit. So, once I add this and resubmit the form, well, it works, that's great, but where the heck are my book attributes, the fields for my books, they're just completely gone. Um, and so to fix this, uh, I have to go into my uh, create action, and uh, when the author fails to create, I have to then rebuild my books object. So once I add this, um, I can then submit my form and get errors, um, the right errors that I need, and the Form the fields are back for my books, but you know I still don't have any validations on them. So 
Um, if, what have you seen so far for accepts nested attributes? You know, doesn't dissuade you from from using them. Um, you can go to uh, you know the Rails GitHub and see that there's you know open issues still for accepts nested attributes for. Um, you know, this one in particular, um, the uniqueness validation uh, with the scope is just broken. And what I suggest to do instead is just to use the you know normal RESTful routes and create your um, you know parent and child resources one at a time. So you know first just create your author. Once you create it, you then have a link to start creating its um, child resources. So you can just add a book, um, and then all of the validations for that book will work because you just have you know a simple, clean form. So my suggestion is to keep it simple. Um, you know, just avoid complex forms if you can. And the next headache that uh, uh, that I see all the time is with microservices, where people want to build lots and lots of applications early on. And this is pretty apparent in the startup world, where people are trying to build applications as fast as they can, and they don't really think about you know consequences once you start separating things early on. So I had this one project where, you know, I thought originally it was just going to be this, you know, just a Rails app with a single database. But, you know, we were a new team and we were building quickly and it soon evolved into a Rails app with, uh, you know, a back-end API. Um, there was, uh, the front end got separated into its own application as a client-side Rails uh, Angular app. And it didn't stop there. There was uh, another application that shared a user table. And the, actually, the client side Angular app had its own database to collect data uh, in a separate process. And then we had you know, an iPhone app, an Android app, and this just became <laughs> a huge nightmare. <laughs> so, you know, what was wrong with just keeping this as one single app? You know, especially early on in development. Was there some conversation I missed out on, monolithic versus microservices discussion? So, you know, I started looking into uh, reasons for monolithic versus microservices and trying to find some case studies where microservices really worked well. So, uh, you know, I found a couple of cases where, you know, SoundCloud um, and um, Carbify, there's this develop this stuff shop in Los Angeles where they had these very large, complex applications, and um, they were losing lots of productivity. Um, you know, waiting hours and hours for their tests to, to finish running, and so they had very successful experiences splitting up their monolithic app into, you know, individual services. So, I realized that you know you need microservices when your test suite takes hours to run, your models are you know several hundred or thousand lines of code. And this is just making you less and less productive because of the over complexity. But the thing is, with my team, we didn't have any of these problems. We were a team size of you know less than six people. Our biggest models were like 400 lines of code. Our tests you know only took five minutes or less to run. Um, but I was less productive because I had to deploy um, you know managing deployment for all these different applications, managing all these different API endpoints. So. I was wondering you know, why, in the beginning, we had to create this very complex design. And there are two things in play that, that I've realized. And one is we just wanted to over-engineer and pre-optimize and look ahead in the future. Um, for example, one part of our application was payments processing. So you figure you could extract that out into its own application. And so down the line, you could use the same payments application for other things. Or maybe you want to separate out uh, a templating part of the application, reuse templates for other things, but um, you know, business requirements change all the time and you actually never get there. You never end up using the thing that you thought would be so great. Um, there's also this uh, front-end developer paradigm that um, I think uh, you know, the, I think the notion of front-end developer versus back-end developer is something new. Um, I haven't been developing for that long, but when I started, there really wasn't such a thing as a front-end developer, but now with the advent of JavaScript frameworks like you know, React or Angular, uh, front-end developers never have to touch the database. They can um, mock the um, you know, calls to a, to a back-end and 
work on front end and create a you know really nice dynamic UI, which is great. But one of the patterns I see now is back end developers, um, you know, create a back end API. Front end developers, um, you know, can just can just mock it and make their you know work on their own app separately. But it adds a layer of complexity. So why can't we just keep the monolith? Well, um, I think this is something that would make a lot more sense and, and much it'd be much easier to manage. And um, Nick Sutter has a really great quote about this. Um, he says, what's so hard about having a proper object design in one monolithic Rails app? You can have cleanly composed separate layers with interfaces that allow reusability, um, simple testing and debugging. And you know, it's, that's something you can do by you know, namespace in your models or creating service objects or um, extracting logic into gems to create a, a nice, maintainable, you know, single uh, monolithic app. So I wanted to look at some success stories of monolithic apps, and um, Akira Matsuda, you get another shout out, um, <laughs> has a really great presentation uh, of cookpad.com, where um, you know, he's got a team of 50 developers, and he gets 50 million unique visitors a month, 15,000 requests a second, you know, 2,000 tests, and um, they're able to make this work. You know, granted, they have their own in-house deployer, autoscaler, active record adapter, so maybe there's some really, really smart guys and they can make it work, but... Um, Martin Fowler also has some really good advice about this, and, um, you know, he says that uh, all, you know, almost all cases he's heard of where a system was built from scratch starting out as a microservice system, it's ended up in serious trouble. And, uh, um, you know, this, he says you shouldn't start a new project, you know, even if you think that'll be worthwhile to split it up. So, you know, the best way to find out if your software idea is really good is to just build a very simple version of it uh, and test it out and see how well it works. And uh, there's this one quote to sum it all up, and that's learn to walk before you can run. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Questions? Has anyone used Accept and Accept Attributes for and likes it?